You are listening to Theoretical Insights of D&D. Clark! Give me a fireball! Screw how hot your skin is. My bars are hotter. Let me tell you what this is. Let me tell you, you listeners, if you don't know what the zombie has packaged in his decaying flesh. You shut up, cancer bones. (laughs) You're going to be a zombie if that cancer doesn't get cured. Hey guys, I'm Rob. And I'm here. And welcome back to Theoretical Insights of D&D, where today we are covering the Bard subclasses put out by Cobalt Press. Well, at least the ones that we have access to. Yeah. So, realistically, the best thing for us to do is go over the Bard one more time. It's a really good class. Honestly, it's like my, it's my number two class. The Cleric is my number one. The Bard is my number two. I mean, technically, you are a bard, so. Oh yeah, there. I'm I'm a I'm a real life bard, so it kind of has to be one of my favorites. So, as a bard, your hit point die is one d eight. Proficient with light armor, simple weapons, hand crossbows, long swords, rapiers, and short swords, you get three musical instruments of your choice. Saving throws are dexterity and charisma, and you get to choose any of the three skills available that you would like to have as far as starting equipment you can take a rapier or a long sword or a simple weapon a diplomat's pack or an entertainer's pack a lute or any other musical instrument and you get leather armor and a dagger i mean the the base of the bard sounds kind of boring i'm not gonna lie Mm -hmm. uh it's just okay i'm gonna carry around the guitar with some leather armor a dagger and a rapier or a long sword and i have an entertainer's pack to where i can make some balloon animals it's probably why I've never played a bard. As we go through the rest of this, you're going to regret kind of not. So at first level, you get spell casting. Mm-hmm. You'll get your two cantrips known uh, from your choice of the bard spell list, which the only one that is specific to the bard is Vicious Mockery, and it's a great cantrip. Now, granted, it's only a D4 damage, but... When you're in heavy role play as a bard and you cast Vicious Mockery and your DM says, all right, what do you say to this person as you cast Vicious Mockery? You can come up with absolutely ridiculous stuff right off the top of your head. And it's some of the funniest crap you'll ever hear in your life. True, true. And, of course, you'll be able to get spell slots as well. And at first level, just like any other first level spell casting class, you'll have two cantrips known with four spells that you can know, and you'll have two first-level spell slots. Spellcasting ability is going to be your charisma, so it's somewhat similar to the sorcerer and the Mm -hmm. warlock in that spectrum. However, there's there's a lot more utility that comes with a bard. So things like uh, Bigby's Hand and um, Healing Word, stuff to cause fear, stuff to cause um, control. There's a lot of utility that comes with, with the Bard. And here's the kicker for the class, Bardic Inspiration. You can inspire others through stirring words or music. So whenever you... You can take a bonus action on your turn to choose one creature other than yourself within 60 feet who can hear you, and that creature gains one Bardic Inspiration die and that's a D6 where it starts at. However, it starts at a D6. At 5th level, it goes to a D8. Mm-hmm. At 10th level, it's a D10. And by 15th level, if you go straight bard, which some people do and some people don't, oftentimes they multi-class a bard with something else. But the bard is a good class to take all the way to 20th level. By 15th level, that inspiration die becomes a D12. At second level, you get Jack of All Trades, where you can add half your proficiency bonus rounded down to any ability check you make that doesn't already include your proficiency bonus. So pretty much you're half proficient with every skill. Yeah. And that's really useful. That's stupidly useful. That can come in so many uses. Also, you gain Song of Rest. You can use Soothing Music or Oration to help revitalize your wounded allies during a short rest. So pretty much, if you were a friendly creature who can hear your performance, 
regains hit points at the end of a short rest by spending one or more hit dice. Each of those creatures regains an extra 1d6 hit points. And that goes up as well. It goes up to a d8 at 9th level, d10 at 13th, and a d12 at 17th. That's actually really good. Yeah. Now, granted, we don't usually get a whole lot of short rests in the games that we play. But if you were in a game that you knew you were going to be getting a lot of short rest, Song of Rest are, is is really, really good. I mean, I, I'm sure we could take more in our games. But we, yeah. It's just one kind of one thing we look over. Yeah. At third level, that is where you get your Bard College, a.k.a. your subclass. And we'll be covering the three the first three from Cobalt Press in just a little bit. But also, you get expertise. You get to choose two skills in which you are proficient with and then double your proficiency in those two skills, whether it be performance, intimidation, stealth, sleight of hand, whatever it is, you get to double your proficiency bonus. And it's not it's not a whole lot by third level because your proficiency bonus is only a plus two. However... Instead of, say, you've got a plus four to your charisma and you're trying to persuade somebody to give you some information, instead of just getting a plus five, now you're getting a plus seven. Mm -hmm. And at third level, a plus seven is a lot. That's why a lot of times rogues are so ridiculously powerful in early, like, uh, lower level gameplay because of the fact they have expertise in their stealth or sleight of hand or um, acrobatics. Yeah, they're a lot harder to pin down. You get an ability score improvement to where you can also take a feat if the DM allows it when you reach fourth, eighth, twelfth, sixteenth, and nineteenth level. At fifth level, you gain font of inspiration. This is what makes the bard so useful in game. You get to you regain all of your expended uses of bardic inspiration when you finish a short or a long rest. See, before then, you had to finish a long rest. But as soon as you hit fifth level, you can stop for half an hour after a big fight and immediately get all uses of your bardic inspiration back. And by this level, it's already a D8, I believe. Yeah, that's that's when it becomes a D8. Now, Bardic Inspiration, for a little bit of a breakdown on it, if you kind of forgot how it works or if for some reason you've never heard of a Bard, Bardic Inspiration is something that can be used for an attack roll or an ability check or a saving throw. So that would be a D8 added to whatever you rolled. Sometimes a make or break situation. But yeah. there's a certain subclass that... uh the wife is playing in my game, uh, the College of Valor, in which you can add that bardic inspiration into the damage roll of the attack as long as you hit. And that I has believe, helped quite a few times. Yeah, I believe that the College of Valor is the only one that can do that, if I'm not mistaken. I believe Valor is the only one that can add it into the damage roll. Now, College of Swords is a little bit more annoying as a dm because you can roll your bardic inspiration die and add the result to your ac until the start of your next turn so you can go up to yeah if you're if you're wearing say a plus one leather you got a plus four in your decks you're sitting there with a 16 or 17 ac and you're using a shield as a college of swords you roll your d8 roll an eight you've got a 24 ac until the start of your next turn hmm yeah, it gets kind of crazy. At sixth level, when whenever me and Jeremiah were covering this to begin with, counter charm. Counter charm is it's it's okay. It's not great. It is it's not even technically good, but it's something specific to the bard in which can come in in certain niche situations that can turn the tide of a battle in your favor. Or keep it from being turned into the enemy's favor. I'll put it that way. So by sixth level, you gain the ability to use magical notes or words of power to disrupt mind-influencing effects. As an action, you can start a performance that lasts until the end of your next turn. During that time, you and any friendly creatures within 30 feet of you have advantage on saving throws against being frightened or charmed. And the performance ends early if you are incapacitated or silenced or if you voluntarily end it. 
you're losing an entire turn. Realistically, it's only useful if you're, I mean, if you're metagaming, you know it's going to be useful. Um, if you're around the dragon or any kind of like a dragon fear effect that's an AOE within 120 feet of you, then that's very useful. But most of the time, you're not running into stuff that has that kind of ability. Yeah, It's good to have it as a backup. Like don't don't misunderstand me. It's good to have as a backup, but overall, it's not that useful because the likelihood of you actually being able to use it in game and use it to its full potential is very low. At tenth level, you get another expertise, so you get two more skill proficiencies in which you double your proficiency bonus. Also, at tenth level, you get magical secrets. You have plundered magical knowledge from a wide spectrum of disciplines. You get to choose two spells from any class, including the bard. A spell you must choose a spell you choose must be of a level you can cast, as shown on the bardic table. The chosen spells count as bard spells, so you use your charisma modifier. And you will also get two additional spells from any class at 14th and again at 18th level. So you get six free spells throughout the entirety of leveling a bard. Now, one of the things that you might not realize is things like lightning bolt, fireball, flame strike, and the really heavy hitting offensive spells are not available to the bard because they're more focused on stuff like dissonant whispers and fear and the stuff that's going to be bringing in control and utility. So this coming in, by 14th level, you'll have access to 7th level spell slot. That could be things such as um, Circle of Death, Blight at 4th level, uh, Flame Strike, the 5th level spell, Harm or Heal, both 6th level spells. Very, very good spells. Uh, also, the possib- I think the Bard, if I'm not mistaken, already has access to something like Force Cage. But you could also do like Wall of Fire, Wall of Ice, Wall of Water, Wall of Stone. You can go in and get some more um, kind of control-esque, utility-esque spells that aren't necessarily available to the Bard right off. Or you can go in and get Fireball and cast a 7th level Fireball because it's fun. You also gain, and pretty much that's it, you get Magical Secrets at 10th. 14th and 18th level there are no more bardic things from the base bard that you get until you get 20th level superior inspiration when you roll initiative and have no uses of bardic inspiration left you regain one use once again not overly useful but it's nice to be able to get that use of inspiration back if you get jumped off in the middle of nowhere yeah that could that could come in handy one time Pretty it's, much. It's not like the, the good old paladin where they basically become uber paladins or the druid where they become guardians of the world and all that other stuff. It's just an extra inspiration. Yeah. So let's get this list started with the College of Criminology. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Have the freaking Law and Order SVU theme play. <laughs> With some of the campaigns I've heard about, an SVU freaking bard would be handy. Oh, very. <laughs> we would need a fighter in Stabler. The yeah. the bard would be the uh, God. I don't remember his name. The bard would be the uh, older guy that died not too long ago. Yeah. He would be the bard. Either him or maybe Ice T. Oh, definitely Ice T. <laughs> bards pick up all sorts of information as they travel the land. Some bards focus on a certain type of information, like epic poetry, love ballads, or body drinking songs. Others, however, turn to the shadowy occupation of criminology. These bards use their knack for gathering information to learn about criminals and vigilantes, their tactics and their weaknesses. Some criminologists work work with agents of the law to catch criminals, 
but shadier members of this college use their dark knowledge to emulate the malefactors they have studied for so long. When you join the College of Criminology at third level, you gain proficiency in the insight skill and your choice of two of acrobatics, deception, investigation, performance, sleight of hand, and stealth. Gaining insight proficiency is always useful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't matter what kind of class you're playing, even if you don't really have that high of an intelligence. Uh, is it? It's intelligence that goes into insight, isn't it? I believe so. Let me. I believe it's intelligence. No, it's wisdom. Yeah, it's a perception check, kind of. Yeah. It's it's actually really useful for any campaign. That way you can tell oh, yeah. if somebody's being truthful with you or not. Also, at third level, you gain quick read. Your knowledge of underhanded tactics allows you to gain insight on your foe's strategies. As a bonus action, you can spend a bardic inspiration die to make an insight check against one creature you can see within 30 feet, contested by its deception check. You can roll the bardic inspiration die and add it to the result of your check. You have disadvantage on your check if the target's not a humanoid, and the check automatically fails against creatures with an intelligence score of 3 or lower. On a success, you gain the following benefits. The target has disadvantage on attack rolls against you for one minute. You have advantage on saving throws against the target's spells and magical effects for one minute, and you have advantage on all attack rolls against the target for one minute. That's really good. So it seems like you're becoming Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. At, at first, when I started to read that, I was like, this is going to be kind of one of those, like, uh, what was it, the 14th level thing from the college of not the college but the uh, path of ancestors i thought it was going to be another one of those eh, they oh, could have yeah. done something different here but that's actually really good because that's a minute of disadvantage mm -hmm. against you advantage pretty much magic resistance against that creature for one minute and then you have advantage on everything you do against that creature mm -hmm. whether it be if you picked up a firebolt or um eldritch blast in the future through your um, magical secrets yeah. or you use your short bow or crossbow or rapier or whatever you're using. It's oh, actually really this good. This would be really good to cross with a ranger. It would be. Like a and you gloom wouldn't... stalker? Well, not even so much, not even so much the gloom stalker, but like the uh, swarm keeper. Yeah, that would work too. It would be really good with a swarm keeper as well, um, or even a hunter. Mm -hmm. A hunter would be really good with this, and you wouldn't even have to go that high in the ranger level as far as the multi-class goes because you, you don't want to lose out too much on what the bard's doing. Yeah, I mean, it'd be enough to get like your basic ranger subclass stuff. Yeah, and on the bright side, you're getting a lot from the Bard outside of just the college because you're only getting three things from colleges with the Bard. Yeah. It's not like some of the other classes where you've got multiple things going in. You get three levels, uh, third, sixth, and 14th, and that's it. That's when yeah. you get a subclass preacher. Speaking of which, Bardic Instinct at sixth level, you can extend your knowledge of criminal behavior to your companions. When a creature that has a bardic inspiration die you gave them is damaged by a hostile creature's attack, it can use its reaction to roll the inspiration die and reduce the damage by twice the number rolled. If this reduces the damage of the attack to zero, the creature you inspired may make a single melee attack against its attacker as part of the same reaction. That's very good. Yeah. By six level, that's a D8. You double it. If you roll an eight, that's 16. Take it to zero. Your fighter now gets to make a single attack against that as the same reaction after taking no damage. That's stupid good. That is really good. Now, couple that with the warlock that we just covered in the last episode where it's reduced. The, no, the first episode, the genie. The genie lord, where you're reducing damage oh, yeah, as the yeah. warlock as well. So you've yeah. got both the genie lord and this bard in the same party. Nobody's going to be taking any damage. Yeah. And at 14th level, you get hot pursuit. 
When a creature fails a saving throw against one of your bard spells, you can designate it as your mark for 24 hours. You know the direction of your mark at all times unless it's within an anti-magic field and is protected by an effect that prevents scrying such as non-detection. Or there's a barrier of lead at least one inch thick between you. So this is like an (laughs) x-ray. Additionally, whenever you... Your mark makes an attack roll, or you make a saving throw against one of its spells or effects. You can spend an inspiration die to roll roll it and add or subtract the result from the roll. You can choose to do so after the d20 is rolled, but before the GM tells you the outcome of the roll. So you, wait a minute. Not only are you getting advantage You're getting magic resistance against the creature for a minute. You have advantage on all attack rolls against the creature. They have disadvantage on all attack rolls against you for a minute. You're reducing damage to anybody that's coming in and getting an attack at them that's carrying your bardic inspiration. Mm -hmm. But at 14th level, if an attack is made your way with disadvantage and they just so happen to roll a 19 with disadvantage because they've got a plus 7 to hit, you can say, okay, I'm going to roll my Bardic Inspiration die, which at 14th level would be a whopping D10, I believe. Yeah, 14th level is a whopping D10. Next thing you know, you roll an 8. Uh, take 8 away from their roll. Yeah. And it misses. That's stupid. Because here's the thing. We have to yeah. think of all else the Bard's doing in between all this bull crap. Mm-hmm. The Bard is one of the most annoying classes to, to run a game against or for because they're doing so much on the social platform or the social setting. Where they're talking to people, mm-hmm. getting their way, persuading, intimidating, or decept- uh, deceiving their way to the top. And then in combat... They're making everything to the point to where if you fail a saving throw against their spells, they're feared, they have to run away, they fall on the ground laughing, and they're incapacitated for a minute or a turn, or they're stunned because if I'm not mistaken, a bard gets access to hold person. Yeah, I think so. And at 14th level, you would gain, you would already have uh, two, two accesses of magical secrets to where you could have your separate class spells. So something like harm or heal or flame strike from the cleric, fireball, lightning bolt, lightning bolt, or uh, chain lightning from um, the wizard and sorcerer spell books. Mm-hmm. Smite from the paladin. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even, I didn't even think about that. Hold up. Yeah. Wait a minute. Do tell. You, 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 with your magic secrets, you take smite as the criminology college, (laughs) and then you have advantage on all attack rolls against the creature for one minute. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. And at 14th level, not only are you having your branding smite, banishing smite, uh, the divine smite, whatever you want to, whatever kind of smite you can get, but then you get to add your bardic inspiration die to the attack roll if you don't think that a 12 is going to hit. So you roll your D10, and you add 10 if you roll a 10, and then you get up 22 to hit. Bonus action, cast uh, the cast smite with advantage. This is this just became busted. This just bit. became this just became a broken subclass. And wow! You, and you know what would make a really good race to do this with? Especially RP wise. What's that? A Kinku. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd rather have a Kinku than a freaking halfling because the last thing I need on this is halfling luck. I mean, you can always go halfling. Have a have a halfling in a freaking black trench coat and his little hat going up to somebody. Did you kill that man? <laughs> well, here here's another thing. Because the drow in D D are often like considered the dark elves yeah from the underdark they usually come from like a shady background or whatever Mm -hmm. um bard of criminology drow that would be that puts me in like the old black and white detective movies yeah like uh, like, spider-man noir oh yeah spider-man noir that's what i was thinking with the, the kinku this is a great subclass it is it is a really good especially it's a 
I can't say it's an especially good RP or good combat because it's good at both. Yeah, like it, it does both pretty much consistently well. Well, I will say when it comes to the social aspect, like what me and Jeremiah and you were talking about in the power game or not power game, but the power gap episode, Mm -hmm. there are three areas in which power gap really comes into play. And that's the combat, the social and the, um, exploration side of things. Exploration. There's nothing in this that helps with that. Now you can get your expertise in survival or something like that to where you can track or perception or whatever. Yeah. That's just the bard, but the college is really good for the social aspect. Mm -hmm. Very good for the combat aspect of the power gap. Yes. Very good. I would say more useful for the, for the combat side. However, it is giving you access to insight along with uh, two more choices of acrobatics, deception, investigation, performance, sleight of hand or stealth. So the the social interaction with this person, depending on how it's built, would be very strong as well. Because by, say, 14th level, you'll have a plus five in your charisma. Yeah. And you automatically get to choose three skills at the start as a first level bard. Then you get the third level and you get insight and then get two more. Mm-hmm. So you're going to be proficient with just about everything. Then you add in jack of all trades, then two increases, of, then two uses of expertise to where you get expertise in four of your, um, in four of your skills. Jack of all trades is automatically adding by 20th level a plus three to everything. Yep. This is a absolutely outstanding subclass. I would, I would actually really like to play this, especially if the entire campaign was, like set set around the city, you wouldn't be going out in the woods, in the wilderness, trying to find something. You remember the world building episode that we did, mm-hmm. where it was kind of like a Noor campaign, you know, yeah. two or the bunch of rival kingdoms, and you got to go find this person because they were supposed to be dead, but they're not. And now they're yeah. trying to do all this stuff. You're gathering information, sneaking into places. Yeah, this is College of Criminality. Yep, criminology. That's a very good subclass. Like, we're starting off strong. It is. It is starting off pretty strong. I'll have to say. Next up, we have the College of Echoes. Echoes, echoes, echoes. Uh, I'm sorry. (laughs) In the underworld, sound works differently than on the surface. Your exposure to echoes has taught you about how sound changes as it moves and encounters obstacles. Inspired by the effect caves and tunnels have on sounds, you have learned to manipulate sound with your magic, curving it and altering it as it moves. You can silence the most violent explosions as you can make whispers seem to reverberate for error forever. And you can even change the sounds of music and words as they are created. Okay, that's cool. The caves are alive with the sound of music. That's that's a yeah. that's a really cool expl- like just introductory little paragraph. Echo location. Okay, there has to be a bat. There has to be a bat player race. Let me while you read, I'm gonna research that. When you join the College of Echoes at third level. You can learn how to see with your ears as well as your eyes. As long as you can hear, you have a blind sight out to a range of 10 feet, and you have disadvantage on saving throws against effects that would deafen you. Eh. By 14th level, your blind sight is now to 15 feet, but you no longer have disadvantage on saving throws against effects that would deafen you. So that's, you know, it's it's an even trade. You have to get the 14th level, though. But dang, disadvantage mm-hmm. on things that could deafen you. That's blindness, deafness. You're making that with disadvantage. You also get alter sound. This is a bit of a list. At third level, you can manipulate the sounds of your speech to mimic any sounds you've heard, including voices. Okay. A creature that hears the sounds can tell that they are imitations with a successful insight check contested by your deception check. In addition, you can manipulate some of the sounds around you. You can use your reaction to cause one of the following effects. 
enhance. You can increase the volume of a sound originating within 30 feet of you, doubling the range it can be heard and granting creatures in range this, of the sound advantage on perception checks to detect the sound. In addition, when a hostile creature within 30 feet of you takes thunder damage, you can expend one use of Bardic Inspiration and increase the thunder damage by an amount equal to the number you roll on the Inspiration die. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Dampen. You can decrease the volume of a sound originating within 30. It's pretty much going to be the exact opposite of that. Dampen is the exact opposite of enhance. Yeah. Still 30 feet. But whenever a friendly creature within 30 feet takes th uh, thunder damage, you can decrease it by a use of Bardic Inspiration. Distort. You can change one word or up to two notes within 30 feet of you to another word or other notes. You can expend one use of Bardic Inspiration to change a number of words within 30 feet of you equal to one plus the number you roll on an Inspiration die. Or you can change a number of notes in the melody within 30 feet to 2 plus double the number you roll. A creature that can hear the sound can notice it was altered by succeeding on a perception check contested by deception. At your GM's discretion, this effect can alter sounds that aren't words or melodies, such as altering the cries of a young animal to sound like the roars of an adult. It's pretty good. It does sound pretty good so far. Disrupt. When a spell... Okay. Spellcaster casts a spell with verbal components within 30 feet of you, you can expend one use of your bardic inspiration to disrupt the sounds of the verbal components. The spellcaster must make a concentration check, DC 8 plus the number you roll on the bardic inspiration die, or the fell spells and have no effect. You can disrupt the spell only if it is a spell level you can cast. Okay. So it's, it's counterspell. It's counterspell at level 3. But well, I mean the highest the highest they're ever going to have to try and beat is a fourteen. Yeah, at level three. And realistically, the highest they'll ever have to try and beat is a twenty. So, is it useful? Yes. Is it good? Eh. It's it's not overly good, but it it is annoying. And that's well, kind of the idea of a bard. Annoying. That's kind of the idea of a bard to begin with is to just kind of try to be annoying to your enemies at sixth level you get resounding strikes when you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack you can expend one spell slot to deal thunder damage to the target okay there it is in addition to the weapons damage the extra damage is a 1d6 for a first level spell slot plus 1d6 for each spell level higher than first to a maximum of 6d6 the damage increases by 1d6 if the target is made of inorganic materials such as stone, crystal, or metal. Mm -hmm. And then you use your Bardic Inspiration die to increase the damage again. Imagine a Thunder Cleric multi-classing with this. Oof. Well, the Tempest Cleric is more lightning than anything because there are, there's a lot more lightning damage dealing spells than there is thunder. Yes, However, thunder and lightning, you are Thor. Well, think of this. With your magical secrets or magical knowledge, uh -huh. you can get Thunder Step. Oh, yeah. It's Misty Step, but damage. Yeah. And it's a third level spell. So I believe whenever it's a it's up to a sixty foot teleportation and they take however many D eight. I believe it's like three D eight. I think. It is three D ten. Okay. It's three D ten thunder damage. And then because of that, you can use your Bardic Inspiration to increase it by tenth level. Your bardic inspiration is going to be a D10, so you can increase it by another D10. So you'll be you'll be dealing with a third level thunder step, four D10 thunder damage. Yeah, that's pretty good. Now, there's a lot more building that has to go into this than the College of Criminology. You yeah. you have to specifically build this one, but I mean, realistically, if somebody's paying attention, it's not going to be that hard. No, it's... at 14th level, you gain reverberating strikes. 
Your bardic inspiration infuses your ally's weapon attacks with sonic power. A creature that has a bardic inspiration die from you can roll that die and add the number rolled to a weapon damage roll it just made. There's a second subclass that allows that. And all of the damage from that attack becomes thunder damage. The target of the attack must succeed on a strength saving throw against your spell save DC or be knocked prone. That's good. That is good. Put that up there with the barbarian. Yeah. That's really good. And there is a... I found a uh, homebrew class for the Bat Pope, the Nectar. Sweet. It is on D&D Beyond. They uh, they have a dex plus one, a wisdom plus one. Uh, their size is about four to five feet tall. They have a base walking speed of 25 feet, but they have flight of 40 feet. And it's half to 20 feet if they use medium armor. They're in heavy armor, they can. Uh, they got fangs that do a d4. They have dark vision. Uh... Oh, you have superior dark vision. They have sun sickness. Echolocation, which gets them blind sight for 30 feet in all directions. Uh, sensible hearing, they get advantage on wisdom checks that involve listening unless deafened. So that would actually be really good for this subclass. Mm-hmm. And there is there's two variants of this. There's the fruit nectar which has a wisdom plus one. They're vegetarians. Uh, They eat fruits, veggies, seeds, or nectar for sustenance. You can ingest other types of food, but need regular intake of plant-based food. Only rations of vegetable foods count as rations for you. Huh. And they have a confusing cry. You can make a high-piercing shriek designed to surprise and confuse predators. You can use this action to scream in a 10-foot cone. Each creature in that area must make a con save equal to 8 plus your proficiency plus con mod. On a failed check, the creature takes 1d4 1D plus your con modifier of thunder damage and has disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks until the start of your next turn. We'll see, with enhance, you can double the size of that cone from 10 yeah. to 20 feet. And then you have the uh, Seguine Nectar. Ability score increases a dex plus one, and they are carnivores. Same thing as a vegetarian, but they must have uh, meat on a regular basis. And they have a hunting cry, which is the same 10 feet cone. They got to make a con save against your proficiency plus con. On a failed check, the creature takes a d4 thunder damage and is stunned until the start of your next turn. Hmm. Once again, you can increase the thunder damage with that. Mm-hmm. So there's your, your bat folk. That's actually really good. That would be the perfect race for the subclass. Yeah. Overall, I mean, I think this is good. It is not College of Criminology. It is not Criminology, but it is a good, it is a good subclass. It is a good subclass. Next up, we have the College of Enthropy. Bards of the College of Enthropy are itinerant. Yeah, itinerant. Okay. Itinerant gamblers and daring thrill seekers whose actions are supremely unpredictable. Rather than relying on ancient lore or skill with arms, these bards throw themselves into new challenges just to see what happens, trusting in luck to see them through. Okay, I like this already. They're called luck stillers with a mixture of derision and respect because no matter how bad things get for everyone around them these bards always seem to come out unscathed at third level you gain bonus proficiencies with acrobatics athletics and the gaming set of your choice okay you also get luck stiller you learn to borrow a little bit of other people's luck for yourself when a creature that you can see within 60 feet of you makes an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw with advantage, you can use your reaction to expend one of your uses of Bardic Inspiration to grant that creature a penalty to the check equal to the number rolled on your Bardic Inspiration die. You gain inspiration that is 
usable only on yourself and lasts for a number of rounds equal to the number rolled on the inspiration die. If you do not expend the inspiration die before that time, it's lost. Stilling luck, regardless of whether you use the inspiration, causes a chaos magic surge. Ooh. Yeah, and I've been looking at this chaos magic table down here. Yeah, we'll 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 go over that in a second because it's a lot. It is a lot. At sixth level, you gain infusion of fortune. When you cast a chaos spell, you cause a chaos magic surge and regain one use of your inspiration. You regain the use of infusion of fortune after a short or long rest. Huh. Belief is a tool. Everything desires to be something else. At 14th level, as an action, the Luck Stealer can change one known spell to another spell of the same or lower level on the Bard's spell list. At the end of the Bard's next turn, his or her list of known spells returns to normal. Using this ability causes a Chaos Magic Surge. So wait. Can change one known spell to another spell of the same level or lower on the bar spell list. That's that's just dumb. Yeah. Okay. So there are 50, 50 chaos magic surge on the table. So if you roll a one or a two, you cast hypnotic pattern centered on yourself. Three to four, the target of your spell or ability is also targeted by an enlarged spell. If there's no target, the enlarge affects you. Huh. Five to six, an angry constrictor snake controlled by the GM appears wrapped around your waist. Seven to eight, for ten rounds, a gust of wind blows out from you in all directions. 9 to 10, three targets you can see within 60 feet chosen by you are targeted by a ray of frost. That's cool. Yeah. 11 to 12, you rise 30 feet into the air where you hover until the start of your next turn when you fall. (laughs) (laughs) 13 to 14, you grow a purple mustache 3d6 inches in length. Okay, this is Markiplier. (laughs) (laughs) 15 to 16, you are cloaked in shadow and reek of brimstone for an hour. During that time, you have advantage on intimidation checks and disadvantage on persuasion checks. 17 to... Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> 17 to 18, you summon a mule 100 feet above the target of your spell or ability. If you do not have a target, the mule appears above you. Both the mule and the creature it lands on take 10d6 bludgeoning damage from the inevitable fall. Or the creature under the mule takes no damage with a successful dex save equal to your spell save DC. (laughs) Mule. Oh, that is so funny. 19 to 20, you cast Contact Other Plane. 20 and 21, rum rains from the sky in a 30-foot radius around you for 10 rounds. The dwarf will be very happy. 23 and 24, you regain your highest level expended spell slot. That's good. 25 to 26, you cast the hemispherical wall of force centered on yourself. 27 to 28, all your hair falls out. (laughs) It grows back at the normal rate. Jeez. 29 to 30, you gain resistance to one type of damage determined randomly for one hour. 31 to 32, loud horns can be heard from for a mile sound for one hour. The sound moves with you. <laughs> oh, that's not good. Move walking through the underdark. <laughs> <laughs> 33 and 34, until you complete a long rest, every word you utter sounds normal, but to you, to you, but is heard by other creatures as incomprehensible babbling. (laughs) This does not impair your ability to cast spells. 
35 and 36, three targets within 30 feet of you that are targeted by a bolt of light are to are targeted by a bolt of light that does 1d8 radiant damage. Each individual can negate the damage with a successful con save. Yeah. 37 and 38, each creature, every creature within 60 feet of you except you teleports 10 feet in a random direction. <laughs> if the destination is a solid or a... Uh, is a solid object or hazardous terrain, the creature doesn't move. 39 to 40, the sun or moon, if it's night, is eclipsed for 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. What the? 41 and 42, you become immune to all damage for one round. 43 and 44, until you complete a long rest, you leave burning footprints that smolder in your wake for five rounds. The flames are not hot, en are not hot enough to ignite easily flammable. Oh, the flames are, are hot enough to ignite easily flammable material. So you can start a wildfire. Yep. <laughs> 45 and 46. You turn into a succulent cooked ham <laughs> for 10 rounds. Each round, there is a 1 in 20 chance that a fiend or another abyssal creature of the GM's choice walks. Wait a minute. I, I messed up. Uh, while a ham, you are incapacitated uh, and are vulnerable to all damage. The gold plate that you appear upon can be sold for five gold. <laughs> 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 what happened to the bar you just turn around there's a there's a pork chop laying on a gold plate there's a gold plate with a ham on it oh no <laughs> at least we got five gold worth of plate that's all folks <laughs> 47 and 48 for 30 feet around you the ground turns into broken uneven difficult terrain 49 and 50. For one hour, you gain a bonus to weapon damage equal to your spellcasting ability. That's good. That's pretty good. 51 and 52. You open a portal to the abyss that stays open for 10 rounds. Each round, there's a 1 in 20 chance that a fiend or other abyssal creature of the GM's choice walks through. 53 and 54. You cast Healing Word on a target of your choice. 55 Imagine being and the healer and having to rely on... Oh. Rolling a 53 or 54 to heal. That's funny. 55 and 56, your eyes turn into... <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> your eyes turn into potatoes <laughs> and fall from their sockets. You are blinded until you receive a remove curse or regenerate spell. Oh, jeez. Imagine having to, having to waste the regenerate on the board because his eyes turned into potatoes. <laughs> hey, there's dinner. <laughs> 57 and 58, you cast a you hear a thunderous sound and are stunned until the end of your next turn. 59 to 60, you cast moonbeam. Hey, I like that one. 61 and 62, an item you hold is covered in continual flame. If you are not holding an item, the GM chooses an item within 30 feet of you to be the target. 63 and 64, you and two targets that you can see within 30 feet of you are affected by a Bane spell. 65 and 66, you gain advantage on your next attack roll, ability check, or saving throw within 24 hours. Okay. 67 and 68 is the same thing, but disadvantage. 69 and 70, a choose a target that you can see within 60 feet of you other than yourself to regain to gain temporary hit points equal to your level. <laughs> 71 and 72. A barrel of lamp oil appears adjacent to you. Just a barrel of lamp oil. Have the barbarian throw it. Why not? But then you get targeted by a fireball and it explodes. Yeah. 73 and 74, you are targeted by a disguised self spell, making you appear as a dirt covered human <laughs> child of the opposite gender. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody at Cobalt Press was smoking that good kush when they were writing this list because this stuff's hilarious. 
75 and 76, dim pink light fills the area around 30 feet around your target. If your spell or ability has no target, the light is centered on it becomes a red light district. Yeah. 77 and 78, you summon a boar to a space you can see within 30 feet. The boar follows your commands for one minute and then disappears. <laughs> okay. It, it is wearing a green dress. Yeah. <laughs> it is wearing a green dress. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Oh no, 79 and 80, you cast Flame Strike centered on yourself. Nice. nice. 81 and 82, you gain 1d4 times 10 pounds of weight. <clears throat> 83 and 84, you gain a plus 2 bonus to your AC for a number of rounds equal to your spellcasting ability. That's good. That's pretty good. 85 to 86. The ground beneath your target or beneath you, if the spell or ability has no target, sinks one foot. The target also falls prone unless it makes a, a successful deck save. 87 and 88. Red silk scarves and origami cranes swirl through the air within five feet, 500 feet of you, causing light obscurement. The scarves are worth 100 gold pieces in total if collected. If collected. Okay. 89 to 90, a table with a hero's feast appears within 10 feet of you. Just imagine being in the middle of a like boss fight and just a table of food pops up. <laughs> you gotta have it fall on somebody, though. 91 and 92, three skeletons under the control of the GM claw their way out of the ground and attack random living creatures until they're destroyed. 93 and 94, you cast bark skin upon yourself. Your hair is permanently replaced with green leaves until you receive a remove curse or comparable magic. 95 and 96. Your teeth turn to moths and fly away. <laughs> <laughs> Ninety-seven to ninety-eight, you sprout insect wings, giving you a flying speed of thirty feet, and the wings last for one minute. Ninety-nine to a hundred, a weapon you can see within thirty feet glows and becomes a magic weapon for one minute. Some of these, some of these are hilarious. Your teeth fall out. Your teeth turn into moths and fly away. It doesn't say that you can get them back. <laughs> You got your hair turning into leaves. You summon Losing a mule. your hair. Summon a, summon a mule 100 feet above somebody for 10 d6 bludgeoning damage. Summon a boar in a green dress. Turn into a Christmas ham. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, dude. <laughs> this subclass is stupid. It is. And I would definitely give it a gnome. Just for the laughs. That's ridiculous. <clears throat> well, I'll go ahead and tell you the College of Criminology is the best out of these three. Yeah. Yeah. By far. And that's where we're ending today's episode before we lose our minds over the Christmas ham. Over a freaking chaos magic table. Tune in for the next subclass review where we cover the Colleges of Shadows, Tactic, and the Greenleaf College. I can't and, wait to see the tactics. I'm I'm curious about that. Yeah. I figure the green leaf's going to be a druid. I would figure so. College of Shadows is probably going to be the more interesting of the three. Or the more, well, I say more combat heavy. For the yeah, three. I would say more combat. I don't know. Well, tactics may know. just be that, that one that surprises you. Yeah, we'll see. In the meantime, keep rolling high. And we'll see you in the next one.